Hi, I'm Greg Dickinson. I'm a travel journalist at The Telegraph. And early on in lockdown, I had this thought. All of the world's most interesting travel writers and adventurers, men and women who are normally impossible to pin down, must now be stuck at home like the rest of us. These are people whose travel stories have the power to take your imagination out of quarantine and on a fantastic journey, far away from your kitchen, your living room, or pile of duvets in your girlfriend's wardrobe, which is where I'm recording this right now. So I've spent my time getting a hold of their numbers and giving them a call. I've asked each of them to share three travel photographs from their own personal archives and to tell me the stories behind them. Think of it as a holiday for your ears. And if you're also thinking, photographs for a podcast, how on earth is that going to work? We're posting all of the pictures on our website for free, alongside a free 30-day subscription to The Telegraph. To take a look, just head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash postcards or follow the links in the show notes of this episode. Are you ready, your end, Kate? I'm recording. Good stuff. You ready, Pete? Yes. And for our opening episode today, we're going to bring you stories of the desert, the jungle and the sea from one of my personal travel heroes. Kate Humble is probably best known for presenting TV nature shows like Spring Watch and Autumn Watch, but she's done a lot more. She was the president of the RSPB for four years. She's written a book called Thinking on My Feet and hosted a load of other factual programs for the BBC. And through everything she does, there's this kind of relentless and almost contagious optimism and positivity, which I think we need now more than ever before. We caught up a couple of weeks ago, and I began by asking her where she's been holding up during lockdown. I am spending lockdown in Wales, uh, which is where I live, um, in the Wye Valley. I love, love where I live. I moved here 12 years ago and and every morning I do wake up. I live on a small holding. Um, I've got pigs and sheep and chickens and ducks and dogs. And every morning I wake up and think, gosh, how lucky am I? I don't quite know how, how I managed to get so lucky to live where I do. And rather than things being quieter, presumably spring is actually quite a busy time on the farm. Spring's really busy, yeah. We've been lambing and we've had a pig farrow a couple of weeks ago. We've got another pig due to farrow in another couple of weeks. Yeah, life sort of uh, very much continues really when when you're farming. And uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been busy. And it, I have to say, again, I think, everybody probably has appreciated just what a magnificent spring we've had this year. After all that rain, when we just thought we would never, you know, be dry again, um, suddenly it's been beautiful. I heard my third cuckoo of spring this morning and I don't know what it is. Something about this time um, has has really focused my mind and, and from talking to other people and seeing what other people are writing, I think many people are feeling this, that small beauties seem to matter so much more. And I was walking the dogs through the woods last night um, at about half past seven. And um, so it's that beautiful kind of golden evening light. And the woods at the bottom of our hill are um, beech and oak woods. And so the beech leaves at the moment are that just glorious kind of neon green and all the bluebells are out and the wild garlic and... And I just, I found myself just stopping in, dead in my tracks, as it were, and just thinking, I don't think I've ever noticed the woods looking this beautiful. And they do look this beautiful every year, but somehow lockdown is making my appreciation of, of those small natural things kind of heightened, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it really does. Yeah. I actually hope that my um my granny's not listening because it was her birthday on May the 3rd and she says every year she's heard a cuckoo by the time it's her birthday and this is the first year ever that she hasn't and apparently and apparently it's put her in a dreadful mood. Oh no, because she... well I'll tell you what I do I'll do for your granny is I will try and record our cuckoo that's been singing like mad this morning. Um I'll try and record it for her and send her a cuckoo. How about that? That would be hugely appreciated. Gr- granny D will be will be forever grateful. <laughs> granny D, I will try. Otherwise I'll just go. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> 
and uh, see if we can fool you. <laughs> She'll never know the difference. <laughs> so on this podcast, we're asking our guests to send in photos from their travels. And um, the ones that you sent in were exactly what we're looking for. What, the most unglamorous photos you can possibly imagine? Exactly. Yeah, that's the dream. That's what we want. And the first one that I want to I talk to you about is this image of you kind of in, standing in front of a white wall looking i don't want to say bedraggled because that's not a that's not a kind word but looking oh no you know, i know i slightly... think i think in the circumstances that's a very kind word <laughs> uh shall i explain why i look like that please do so that photograph was taken in february 1999 and um for many many years and this is just i don't know why this happens to me greg but it does um i get obsessions about particular journeys that I want to do. And for about a decade, I had obsessed about crossing the Sahara, um, but only in the company of the people who trade salt in the Sahara. I wanted to do it in the most authentic way I could possibly imagine. Right. You know, sometimes you hear a phrase or you 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 read a sentence and somehow it had entered my consciousness that there were people who traded salt either from or in Timbuktu. And I just became obsessed with this idea of Timbuktu and salt trading. And I started um, probably in the mid 90s to research um, this, the you know, did people actually still do this? Um, and I found out that they did, that there was a tribe uh, called the Berabish. And I heard that they were still trading salt with camel trains. And they would go up to this place uh, just south of the Algerian border and they would collect salt and then bring it back. And the journey itself was kind of biblical. It was a 40 day round trip. So I got put in touch with uh, an amazing woman working for an, a, a, an American aid agency. And I said, look, I know this sounds mad, but I've been obsessing about this journey for a decade. I don't know whether I can do it. And she said, oh, well, I know a Berabish man. I'll ask and see if I can find him. And in the end, she said, look, they are still doing this journey. But really, I think the only way you're going to be able to work out whether you can do it or not is just to come here. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, I left uh, at the beginning of January 99 with my very patient husband, Ludo. We flew in to Banaco, the capital, and then we travelled by public transport to Mopti and then we took a tiny little plane into Timbuktu and we met a man called Shindug, who was the contact, the Berabish contact of this aid agency worker. And remarkably, within 24 hours, we had the appropriate clothing. We'd gone to the market and had exactly what they wore made for us. We had three metres of material each, which were our turbans. We had a sack of rice, we had a sack of dates, we had a tiny little teapot, which I still own, and two glasses and tea and sugar. And we had a sheep. So literally within 24 hours of arriving, we set off this funny little band of people and our sheep. And we drove north through the Petit Désert out into a um, slightly more kind of sandy region. And we got to this very small, strange settlement where we spent the night and there was a sort of guest hut. So we just slept on the sand in this in this hut and, and somebody brought camel milk in a bowl. And, uh, and then we set off the next day. When we see uh, a group of camels with three men uh, heading north and um, Shinduk said, oh, look, there's a caravan heading north. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I went, hang on, hang on a minute. That's we that's what we want to be doing. So he jumped out of the vehicle and suddenly we heard all this shouting and we thought, is that good shouting or bad shouting? And it turned out it was good shouting. that These people uh, were relatives of Shinduk. And so he said, look, I've got these two mad 
Westerners with me who want to travel to the salt mines, will you take them? And they went, yeah, okay. And so started a 35 day journey. And it was one of the hardest, physically and mentally, one of the hardest journeys I've ever done. One of the most rewarding journeys I've ever done. It actually makes me still feel incredibly emotional at the thought of those three men. And I've no idea what's happened to them, but Rahman was the leader of the caravan. His right-hand man was called Brahim, Abrahim, but he was just known as Brahim. And Brahim said to me on about the third day, with, with Shinduk's help, he sat me down in the sand and he said, while you're here, I'm your father and I will protect you. And it was just done with the most, as I say, extraordinary generosity and dignity. It was everything I hoped it would be. It was the most incredible insight into the desert. And it's funny, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to tell you about this journey is that in a funny sort of way, there's parallels with lockdown because, um, you know, I've started with my walks here around home to notice the little details that actually make me smile, that 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 make uh, a wonder out of a walk that I've done a hundred times. Um, and similarly, when you're going through a landscape that is predominantly sand, you know, or monochrome, you start to notice the tiny little things, the little details that, yeah. you know, start to um, give you kind of reference points through your day. I notice things, you know, sometimes we would travel through the night because it would be 50 degrees during the day. <laughs> and so sometimes we would travel through the night and we'd be sitting on a camel watching the first star and it was Venus. It was the first star that, that rises uh, as the sun sets and um, they call it the shepherd star because it's, you know, it, it sort of reminds them that the, the world is still turning. And then you'd watch the rest of the stars rise and then for the first time ever, I kind of was, was there, was present to notice the stars moving across the horizon. You know, it was like being in a living planetarium. It was extraordinary. I've done some extraordinary things since, but that one was the journey of my life. I think people could listen to it for a lot longer, but we must move on to, uh, to photograph two. Which is same continent, but a very, a very different kind of type of landscape. Um, I mean, clearly you've got a, a love for Africa. Like you, you went to apartheid era South Africa when you were nineteen. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And and then you know travelled from Cape Town to Cairo. But can you can you tell us a bit about this group photograph? The listeners will be able to see all of these photos online. But can you just paint paint a picture so they can imagine what what this photograph looks like? In this photograph, there are a group of men, uh, they're all men, um, and some of them are wearing masks, and it's not because of the pandemic. And some of them are holding guns. And we are in a very verdant setting. I, as usual, look dishevelled. Um, it had just been raining, um, so I'd been very rained on. And I also look ecstatically happy. And you that do. is because I had just had an encounter with an extraordinary animal. So this is the Congo. And I was asked uh, a couple of years ago to go there by uh, a man called Johnny Bealby. He phoned up and he said, I've been contacted by a man called John Kahekwa. And John is in the photograph. He's standing uh, on the left uh, of the photograph, standing up. And John is a very eminent scientist and conservationist who was born in a small village in the Congo on the edge of a national park. Now, the Congo, as we all know, has had a very, very difficult history, um, both in the past and sadly, uh, right up until the present day. 
And John, as I say, grew up in this little village on the edge of the park where everyone is very poor. There are very few resources. There are very few jobs. And so people to just to be able to survive would go into the forest uh, to cut trees, uh, to build their homes and to grow crops. And they would uh, set out traps for bushmeat. They weren't looking to trap gorillas. But nonetheless, a gorilla can get injured in a snare just as, as well as any other animal. Yeah. And um, there are huge fines. Well, of course, these people had no money. They couldn't afford to pay fines and so would go to prison. And it just meant that there was a very bad feeling uh, between the national park and the local people. And so John had set up 25 years ago an amazing charity called the Poli Poli Foundation, to support his village and the people living around the park. Um, you know, it gave training so that they had means of making an income. Uh, it grew trees. They, they established tree nurseries so that people could grow their own wood rather than going into the forest to get it. But the jobs were sort of dependent on tourists coming through and tourists did go. They flocked there. But of course, in recent times after the war in 94, people stopped going. And so the village was back to square one. You know, there was no means of making any income. And John contacted Johnny and said, is there any way you would consider bringing groups to the Congo? This area, you know, it's it's not always safe, but it's it's pretty safe. And we have these amazing animals. And so Johnny contacted me and said, <laughs> you'd go to the Congo, wouldn't you? And I went, yeah. <laughs> in a heartbeat. And so Johnny and I set off and we went via Rwanda and we crossed the border. We met John Kahekwa at the border and we crossed over and we spent the most magical five days. When I arrived at the National Park, they said they're in the bamboo forest. And so uh, we set off first by vehicle and then we started walking and we're walking through what felt like pretty impenetrable forest and it's wet and there's these wonderful, you know, sounds of insects, cicadas and everything. There's just these amazing sounds coming from everywhere. You can't really see anything. The vegetation is so thick and we're walking along and I'm walking behind John Kahekwa and we're walking and I'm just taking in these these smells and these sounds and this this gre this sort of verdancy, this greenery everywhere. And suddenly John goes, <gasps> Did you hear that? And I was like, No, no, what? What? And then he said, just listen, listen. And that was a gorilla beating its chest. And we were like, oh. I said, Are we so close? And he said, We are so close. We are so close. And we walked around a corner and the trackers ahead of us pushed through this sort of, it was like a curtain of vegetation. And I walked around the corner and John took my hand and I just went, oh, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. And I was in tears because I'm so ridiculous and I'm gonna be in tears again. There were 19 gorillas in this clearing, the biggest silverback I have ever seen. I knew the Eastern Lowland gorillas were enormous, but oh my goodness, they were right there. They were right there, this enormous animal. And did he even give us a glance? No, couldn't be bothered. He was lying on his back with his feet in the air and he had a kind of entourage uh, around him of young males. There was only one female in that group. And, and he was just lying there. And it was just, I can't tell you, it was so glorious because he just didn't care. None of them cared that we were there. And again, you have no idea. I have no idea. It takes years, seven or eight years years of incredible dedication on the part of the trackers for gorillas to be that relaxed around people coming into their space. So that's why I am grinning like that. <laughs>
in that photograph. And that's why those men were and still and will always be my heroes. Wow. Okay, moving on from the Congo um, to our third and final photograph. We're closer to home here with some slightly smaller but no less majestic beasts present in this photograph. Can you describe for me what's going on in this shot? I'm in a very beautiful place. It is the Isles of Scilly. I'm actually on St Martin's in this photograph. And so what you can see is the very blue sea in the background and a blue sky and, you know, there's there's a lovely grass and brackens and things like that. And um, in the foreground, as ever, uh, when I have my kind of family photos, I'm upstaged by my three dogs. So there is Teg, who is the ginger and white dog, and she's a working sheepdog, although she does uh, a very good impression of being a pampered pet as well. There's Badger, the black and white dog. Um, he's very old and uh, and deaf and smelly and we adore him. He's our first dog and he's a rescue dog. And then there's my little brown dog, Bella, uh, also very old, now entirely blind, but she wasn't then. And they love being near the sea. And um, we were very lucky because the ferry crossing is is somewhat infamous um, and I am not a good, I don't have good sea legs despite being a diver and um, we had the most flat, calm, beautiful crossing and it actually takes a surprisingly long time and we were sitting outside with all the dogs on the kind of, you know, deck of the ferry and then suddenly, uh, you know, you've, you've had sort of open sea for, 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 you know, a good couple of hours, maybe longer. And then suddenly you start to see these entrancing, tiny little outcrops of land. And some of them have trees on them and some of them don't. It's like being in a storybook. And there are white sand beaches and people talk about it being the kind of Caribbean of the UK. But it re on that particular weekend, it was, you know, it was this, this amazing weather and these white beaches and sparkly sea and, you know, kind of every cliche you can think of, we were experiencing it. And there was a really fun thing that happened that weekend. It was the May back holiday, actually. It was, uh, you know, round about this time of year. And there was a very high and low spring tide. And we were staying on the little island of Briar, um, an opposite Briar, separated by not a very wide channel of water, is the island of Tresco. And they told us that on this particular day at the weekend, uh, when the spring tides happened, the tide would be so low, we could actually walk between Briar and Tresco. We could walk where the sea normally would be. Oh, wow. And not only that, because this is the Sillies, and I know you shouldn't call it the Sillies, please don't write in. <laughs> But there is something gloriously silly uh, about having a festival in the middle of the sea. But that's what they did. That's brilliant. And it was absolutely fantastic. So we set off from Briar with all the dogs, uh, you know, holding our shoes in our hand and, and, and basically walked across the sand and there were people coming from Tresco and we all met in the middle of this channel and someone had made a boat into a bar and there's wonderful local gin and there was someone else cooking kind of paellas and there were sausage sandwiches and it was just this wonderful silly gathering and I mean silly in the best possible way right in the middle of the sea and then we all melted away as the tide came in. What I've noticed about all of the all of your stories and all the pictures is they all kind of they all revolve around beaches or deserts or forests, like the natural world. Um, where where do you think that came from? Why do you think it is that you've got this kind of this inbuilt love and obsession with nature? It's very simple. I think it was the way that I grew up. I grew up in the countryside and I grew up at a time, you know, I'm 51 and so I was born in 1968 and health and safety hadn't been invented then. I wish it hadn't been invented now. You know, we didn't have computers, we didn't have 
telly 24 hours. We had to make our own fun. And if you lived in the countryside, as I did, we had to build camps and climb trees and uh, collect snails and look at birds. And that was what we did. And it was a really, really happy way to grow up. And it's the thing that makes me saddest now when I see children who don't have um, access to the natural world, that it's not a key part of the curriculum. For me, it was absolutely formative part of my education was being outdoors, um, being in nature. And again, something that this lockdown seems to have done is actually reconnected people with uh, nature, made them yearn for it, made made them realise that um, being out in a green space is what we need for our mental health, for our just sense of well-being. And so that's what I seek out. I've been, I've travelled to cities, of course, and going to cities can be very exciting for a couple of days, but really always my place of choice will be somewhere uh, wild uh, where I can basically look terrible and nobody cares. <laughs> this is all starting to make sense. I read I read one article in an interview that you did that you said you like getting closer to nature by being naked. Is this is this the truth? It is the truth. Um, it's a funny thing. I get asked a lot, oh, so, or, you know, oh, I've read you're a naturist. And I said, well, I'm not really. I don't want to do it with anybody else. But there is something just lovely about feeling unfettered by clothing. You know, I love that feeling of the water on my skin. Um, I love the feeling of sun on my skin or rain on my skin. And and as I say, it's a very it's a very private thing. It's not so I don't want to kind of wander around with no clothes on it, in the company of lots of other people with no clothes on. Um, I have no wish to do that at all. It's not naturist. It's just naturalist. It sounds like you've. Your, the world that you're living in is is complete and fulfilling. But I, I wanted to ask the final question really is where, once lockdown has been lifted, is, is there anywhere in the world that you, you are fantasising about, about visiting? Well, it's funny, as you know, I've always loved travelling. In fact, just before the lockdown, literally just before the lockdown, I was in Colombia and I had wanted to go there for, oh, probably 10 years. 12 years, I think. 12 years, in fact, it had been on my list. And Colombia has a reputation, as we all know. But for me, the important reputation that it has is that it's the second most biodiverse country in the world after Brazil. And it's about the fifth of the size of Brazil. For anyone who's interested in birds and bird watching, there are 1800 species recorded, but probably many more that haven't been. It's extraordinary. So that is high on my list to return to. But I have to say, and I don't know whether anyone else is feeling this too, but I'm kind of feeling like, you know, someone who used to fly an awful lot. And I always felt torn about flying um, because I know it has a huge impact on the environment, which I you know, feel so passionately uh, about and that we should be, you know, doing everything we can to protect. And now, as a result of this pandemic, I feel, will I ever fly again? I've, I've, I'm sure. But I think I might only... I think, you know, we said, talk about trips of a lifetime. And I think flights really, really have to count. So Colombia would be somewhere that I would feel is worthy of a plane flight. Um, But I think in the future, there will be places closer to home that I will get as much joy from. I'm dying to go back to the island of Mull, where I've had wonderful wildlife encounters. And I have great friends there who keep saying, is this the year you're going to be coming back to Mull? So I think Mull will be right at the top of my list of a post-lockdown. Well, wherever you go, um, do you promise that you'll write about it for, for the Telegraph Travel? I would be delighted to. Absolutely delighted to. Kate, thank you so much for sharing your postcards with us. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. The wonderful Kate Humble. To see the photographs discussed in this episode, head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash postcards. 
And for a free 30-day subscription to The Telegraph, head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. We'll put links to both of these in the show notes. Now, next week, I'll be chatting with British comedian-turned-TV adventurer Griff Rhys jones about holidaying in Iceland, sailing in the Pacific, and his own internal landscape. I only have one emotion, or two emotions, which is quite jolly and cross. OK, and what were you when you had to jump into the sea? Presumably a bit cross. <laughs> cross! Cross! I was cross. I couldn't believe this was happening. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe now wherever you're listening to your podcast to make sure you don't miss our conversation. Postcards is presented by Greg Dickinson and produced by Pete Norton and Theodora Leludis. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a rating and a review where you're listening or tell someone else about the podcast or both. They're little things, but they really help us to find new listeners. And if you'd like to read more travel writing from me, Kate Humble, follow the link in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>